Oh, that's where that bracelet went. I can't find your cough candy, Warren. I might need one. <clears throat> Thank you for being such a humble servant. Um, the rest of you, uh, please open your Bible to Micah chapter 6. <clears throat> when you found it, please stand up. We're going to read verses 1 to 8. Many of you are probably familiar with verse 8. It's a perennial favorite for shirts and bumper stickers, emblems on mugs and hats. I'm going to put a different spin on it um, because so often we see this as kind of something we need to do. And I, I think Mike is actually using this to indict the people further. But let's wait until we unpack this. Here now, the reading of God's word, Micah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. Hear now what Yahweh says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and I redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent you, sorry, I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O Adam, what is good? And what does Yahweh desire of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Let's pray. Father, we would just ask for the Holy Spirit to be powerfully convicting this morning, not only of sin, but also of righteousness and also of judgment. And we see all three in Micah chapter 6. In fact, we see all three throughout the Bible and Father, I ask that you would show us that outside of Christ, we are guilty, condemned sinners. I pray that you would show us that outside of Christ, we have zero righteousness, that we cannot come before you. And would you show us lastly, Lord, that outside of Christ, there is nothing that remains but fury and indignation, for it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But Lord, would you then show us that in Christ there is grace, that in Christ there is pardon and forgiveness, in Christ there is hope, in Christ there is peace, in Christ there is rest, in Christ there is life in the kingdom. And so, Lord, my desire this morning is not to, to preach a flowery or eloquent sermon, um, but to humbly be used as merely a mouthpiece like Micah, and to remind us all what you desire what you require. And we thank you, Lord, that in the gospel, what you demand, you provide in Christ. And so, Lord, would you help us to run and to flee and to find refuge in him, and then by his spirit to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, to walk humbly with our God. So show us yourself, triune God. For if you show yourself to us and draw us to you, we cannot but walk with you. We cannot walk but walk humbly with you. Oh, that we would be this fragrance in the world. Even as Pastor Cliff preached last week, this is what do among the nations look like. People walking humbly with their God, loving loyalty, and doing justice. 
Well, what a blessing this will bring, how the kingdom will advance, how the church will grow, if you would but show us this, this morning, Holy Spirit. So please, show us our need of Christ. Grant us faith to cling to him. And let us, Lord, uh, leave here um, energized to live for you this week, we pray, for Jesus' sake and in his name, amen. Please be seated. Well, we enter into the now final part or portion of Micah. You remember that it's broken up into three sections and each of them begins with this command in the plural to hear. And you can see in the very first word of Micah 6, that is exactly what he says, hear. And so we're sort of brought into another perspective. We ended somewhat uh, on a high and glorious note as we work through especially chapters 4 and 5, where Micah is now showing the elect remnant the glorious future, that there is a king coming, that he is going to conquer. He is going to be this king born in Bethlehem. And then we saw last week that he is going to save his people and he's going to bring his kingdom and he's going to use seven, yea, even eight shepherds, that as he brings his kingdom, he will, yes, protect his people that he will plant them amongst the nations, that he will purify them. Well, I'm going to continue on with Pastor Cliff's alliterations this morning, but we're moving from the future of chapters 4 and 5 back into the present of chapter 6. You remember that the people of Israel have been living disobedient to the covenant for many, many generations. And God is holy. He does not wink at sin. He does not sweep it under a cosmic carpet. He must deal with it. We are to imitate him in doing justice, and God will most certainly do justice. And so most commentators believe that we're back sort of into the time where Sennacherib is surrounding perhaps the city of Jerusalem, and the people really want the Lord's ear. They want into his presence. They need his help. And so now they're going to say, well, why are you not answering us? It's kind of providential that Brother Matt was reading from Isaiah 59. God's ear is not deaf because he gets old and needs a hearing aid. It's our sins. God does not, cannot, by virtue of his holiness, reward hypocrisy. And we see that the generation of Micah is no different than the generation that preceded them was no different than the generation of Isaiah who would offer up all kinds of sacrifices and celebrate the feasts and yet be living in adultery and idolatry, in oppression and in injustice. And so the people want to hear from the Lord and it seems like he's giving them the cold shoulder. And Micah's going to explain why. So I have three Ps this morning. The first is problem. The second is provision. And the last is pleasure. Hopefully you'll see how that makes sense as we work through. But we see here the problem. Yahweh has a problem with his covenant people. And as we saw from chapter 1, it starts with Israel, but then it is also to extend to the ends of the earth. That Israel is sort of a picture for the world to see what is God like? What does God think of sin? What does God think of covenant treachery? What does God think of rebellion? What does God think of idolatry? And the nations are to look at exhibit A, Israel, that God is holy but full of grace, that he is wrathful towards sin, but he is willing to forgive the penitent. And so please don't just hear, oh, this is for some people way back then. No, this is for the covenant people of the Old Testament, but its message is relevant for all people of the world, that there is a problem that God has not only with Israel of old, There's a problem that God still has with people today. And it's not because God is cranky. I hope you hear how endearing he is. I hope you hear his broken heart over rebellious, inveterate sinners who refuse to hearken to his pleading supplications of them. So let's get to it. The problem. God has in the... ESV, an indictment. He has a charge to bring against his people. The picture here is the courtroom. And this is not civil court. This is more family court. 
And you, you need to see that this is not just some, uh, some judge who is angry, but rather this is a husband who is brokenhearted over a wife who has repeatedly been unfaithful to him. Yes, behold the severity of God. But here, through the words of Ezekiel, God pleading, why will you perish? Why? Why will you turn from me? I've only done good to you, and yet you continue to rebel. Why? Here's your last warning, because spoiler alert, last, next week, it's going to be a little bit more of a dour message. God does bring warnings before he brings the boom. And he is giving his people one last warning. Perhaps you sit here this morning outside of Christ, and I would say the same thing to you as Micah says to the people of Israel. Why would you turn away from the one who has given you life and breath? He has given you a wonderful country as imperfect as it is to live in. He has given you family. He's brought you into a church. You sit under the gospel. He has showered you with blessing upon blessing. And yet, we still are such fault finders with the grace and goodness of God. And I would say to you this morning, why? Why would you do this to such a wonderfully merciful, gracious, and benevolent God? But do hear that God has a problem with sin. He has a problem with sin, and he must deal with it. Yes, he is kind and merciful, but he is also just and holy. And they do not play off of each other. Hear what the Lord has to say. And we remember that this word hear in Hebrew has the idea of not just hearing, like, yeah, yeah, mom, I hear you. What did I say? I don't know, I heard you. It has to do with an internalization of God's word that leads to obedience. If you were to let your eye go up to the very last verse of chapter five, it says, and in anger and wrath, I will execute vengeance on the nations that did not hear. And the ESV says obey, but it's the same Hebrew word, shema. And so please don't just hear what Micah's saying. He wants what you hear to lead to a resolve to an action, to the obedience that comes from faith. And so I'm praying often internally, oh God, help them not just to hear the word that comes from my mouth, but they would hear Christ. That as, as, as this pleading of God goes forward, that you would speak. And they would not just hear and not hear, or see but not see in the language of Isaiah 6. But in the words of Wesley's hymn, he speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. So hear, I'm pleading with the dead, hear what the triune God says, Father, Son, and Spirit, arise. He's speaking to Micah, right? He says, hear to the people of Israel. Now he speaks to Micah, arise. Plead your case before the mountains. Micah is Yahweh's attorney, if you will. He's the prosecuting lawyer. And before I move on, I want you to understand how important it is for God's covenant messengers to be obedient to what he says. God so loves the world that he sends his messengers, Christ being the ultimate. God is so concerned about the welfare of Israel that he sends Micah with an uncomfortable message. He sends Micah with uncomfortable grace. The people think that they're okay with God, right? We might say in 2024, they're sitting on, in church. They've got their Bibles. They're nodding their head when they need to. They even say an off-the-cuff an off amen now and then. They sing the words. They shake the hands. And yet everything might not be okay. They might be living a double life. Not only do the mountains see it, but God Almighty sees it. And so I want you to understand, if you're a Christian this morning, your obedience is important in God's mission to the ends of the earth as we seek to reconcile sinners to Christ, 2 Corinthians 5. God is working through his people to bring the nations to himself. But do you understand, Christian, you have an uncomfortable message 
that you are to share, not only with Israel of old, but with the world today. God has a problem with sin. God is angry, we saw in Isaiah, with the wicked every day. God just isn't uncomfortable with sin. God hates sin. Is it because he's angry? No, it's because he's holy. God doesn't choose to hate sin. I've said that a hundred times, I'll say it a million more. God doesn't sort of flip a coin, should I hate sin today? Because God is God, he hates sin. Because God loves justice, he hates sin. Because God loves mercy, he hates sin. Because God is righteous, he must judge sin. This is not a comfortable message, but God is seeking to wake his people up. He has a purpose in this. If you want to add another P to the alliterative sermon. And so here is Micah pleading God's case before the mountains. Why the mountains? See, you have to understand how poetic the Jewish people were and still are. They, they love to paint pictures to sort of stamp it upon our conscience. See, Israel is like the early morning dew that goes away early and is gone. The mountains are unchanging, like God. God doesn't change with cultural norms. He doesn't just say, well, homosexuality, I hate in the Old Testament, but it's a new day, and so it's okay in 2024. He doesn't just say to Micah, I hate divorce, but it's okay now because everyone's doing it. The mountains are unchanging. You see that? Plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, you eternal foundations of the earth. This is why God would often, when he would make covenants in the Old Testament, he would call upon heaven and earth to be his witnesses. Why? Because they're more faithful than people. People are fickle. They change their opinions with the wind, whatever is popular, they will pursue. Not the enduring foundations of the earth or the mountains. This is trouble. You might think, mountains don't hear. Well, I got news for you. Ha trees don't clap their hands either. This is poetic language to show the severity of God's indictment against Israel. His witnesses are not corrupt prophets. They're not preachers who can be hired Right? Pastor Cliff preached that. They're, they're not corrupt rulers. They're objective and reliable witnesses. God has a problem. And so he's not calling Israel to be his witness. Why? Because Israel's unfaithful. You wouldn't ask a liar to be your witness. And so the problem that God has with his people is that they have been unfaithful to him that they are blaming him and saying that he has been unfaithful. He's not listening to us. He's letting the Assyrians destroy Judah. He's let the Assyrians come even to the gates, we saw of chapter one, to Jerusalem, that the threshold of sieging the city and destroying the temple, surely it is God who is at fault. And God says, no, my problem is with your sin. Look at verse three. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. And so God is sort of bringing in these reliable witnesses, and now he's asking the people of Israel, why are you doing what you're doing? I've only been good to you. I've only shown grace to you. I've only been merciful to you. I've given you everything you have ever needed. And so we move from the problem to the provision. And I forgot to mention to you, if I were to entitle this sermon, it would be this, grace for the guilty. And what God's doing through all eight verses is showing and heaping and revealing to Israel and to the world its guilt before him. Okay, you might say, okay, that's God's problem with people thousands of years ago. If you're not in Christ this morning, God has a problem with you too. It's your sin. You are guilty. That's a huge problem. It's a bigger problem than who's gonna win the 2024 presidential election. 
It's a bigger problem of whether conservatives will get into Canadian Parliament. It's a bigger problem than environmental issues, societal issues. This is the biggest problem you have this morning if you're not in Christ, is that you are a guilty sinner in the hands of a living God. And perhaps you're visiting this morning. I hope I, I, I'm not always this severe. But God is trying to wake up a slumbering people. Sometimes you need a little bit of a slap in the face, some cold water, because we grow comfortable with God's grace. And so I pray that if the Spirit is beginning to convict you, that he will bring you all the way from guilt to grace. Here's the provision. This is adding to. Not only is, is Israel guilty, but they're guilty in the light of God's grace. They have abused God's grace. It makes it even more heinous, actually. It's not like they've respo responded tooth for tooth or eye to eye, like God was mean to them, and so now they're being unfaithful to him. God was unfaithful to them, now they're just responding in kind. No, they're actually sinning with, with, with brazenness, with an upheld hand in God's goodness. So here's God's provision. It only heightens the problem of their guilt. For I brought you up. Israel didn't bring itself up. God, it's the picture of God reaching down and pulling up out. He, he, he didn't say, here, I'll lower the line, grab it. He grabbed them and yanked them out of their slavery. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, perhaps... You've not read the Old Testament, but if you were a Jew hearing the words of Micah, Egypt only brought up the connotations of slavery, right? of harshness, of, su of, of subjection, of misery. God then redeemed them from the house of slavery. And I want you to understand that as God is building his case before the mountains who are bearing witness, Israel did nothing to earn this because they're going to ask God, how do we get your blessing? What can we do? And God is saying, remember, what did Israel do so that God would yank them out of, Israel, out of Egypt? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Actually, against their free will, God pulled them out of Egypt. And even when they were murmuring and complaining and grumbling and wanted to go back to the onions and garlic, God was still faithful. So God provided for them redemption. You might say he purchased them. That's what redemption means. That God at great cost to himself provided a firstborn that would redeem them from their slavery. Not only did he provide for them redemption, not only did he provide deliverance, he also provided for them leadership, godly leadership. Do you see that? I sent before you Moses, Arian, and Miriam. And some commentators think, okay, you've got some prophetic, some priestly, and some kingly. I don't know if I agree with that. I'm just saying God didn't just yank them up out of Egypt and say, okay, try your hardest. Hopefully you get to the promised land. No, God is going to say from alpha to omega, from beginning to end, it has all been of me. It has all been of grace. And yet you continue to sin against me. What, what have I done to you? Are you angry at me for, for pulling you out of slavery? Are you sinning against me for providing leadership who brought you into a land flowing with milk and honey? Do you see how perverse the human heart is? Have you witnessed to somebody? They still blame God. They got a $60,000 car. They got a family. They live in a country that has freedoms, not perfect. And they still gripe and complain against God and blame him for all their problems. Oh, how wicked our hearts can be. If you reject Christ, how wicked must your heart be? He's only and ever done good for you. He's died on a cross and been raised from the dead and poured out his spirit. 
If you're a child here this morning who's dead in your sins, he's given you Christian parents who bring you to church, who bring you to Sunday school, who lead family devotions, who pray for you. Oh, my people, remember what Balach, king of Moab, devised. In God's provision, he providentially protected them. Right? He pulls them up out of Egypt, gives them leaders. And even after that, when the nations are conspiring of how to bring a cursing upon them, God nevertheless even thwarts their plans and brings blessing. If you have a, a study note, you can read about this in the book of Numbers. But God was with his people through the whole journey. He never forsook them. He never left them. He, he's showing them just how great their guilt is. They have no reason to be angry or treacherous towards their God, who has only and ever been faithful. Balak hired this false prophet named Balaam, the son of Beor. You can read about that in Numbers 22 through 24. And, 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 and Balak was hoping that somehow he could hire this prophet to bring a curse upon the people of Israel. And God reversed it. If I was a Southern Baptist, I'd say he reversed the curse. So he delivered them out of slavery. He preserved them into the promised land, even thwarting the nations. What did they deserve? They deserved his wrath. Do you remember what God did for them at Gilgal? I would encourage you to go and read Numbers 25, verse 1. Maybe now if I bore you. The people of Israel committed whoredom right after God thwarted Balaam's prayers, right after God thwarted Balak's schemings, they fell into whoredom. Right after that in Gilgal. Remember that. And what did God do? He punished sin. But he still brought sinners into the promised land because he's faithful. He should have wiped them all out. Remember, this is the problem. People forget. And so God, through his faithful servant, through his faithful prophet, is showing the guilt of these people. Why are they living the way they are living? Because they've forgotten God's grace. Some of you who call yourselves Christians, please don't take this as a slap. But my guess is that you're watching things that you should not be watching because you've forgotten God's grace or it's just become common or boring to you. So remember. So let me sort of give some encouragement. This is why it's good to remember the table frequently. Not once a year, not once a quarter, not even once a month. We need to remember the righteous acts of the Lord greater than what he did for the people of Israel in the times of Balak and Balaam, he's done for us in Christ. He has more than brought us out of a physical Egypt, out of physical slavery. He has actually saved us from the world and our slavery to it. He's done something far greater than given us Moses or Arian or Miriam. He's given us his son and poured out the Holy Spirit. Remember this. See, remember what God's trying to do, though. He's trying to woo his straying wife back to himself. And it seems harsh. It's that uncomfortable grace. But he's saying, I've always been so kind to you. Return to me. I could have destroyed Israel after the incident at Gilgal. But I welcomed back the penitent. And so what is God getting at? There is grace for the guilty. But that grace comes to those who repent, to those who turn, right? If you were to check out this marked up Bible, I love the word remnant. And at the very end of the chapter or the book, it says here, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant 
of his inheritance. Well, who are the remnant? The remnant are the repenters. The remnant are those who hear and who act. They're not forgetful hearers. They hear God wooing them, begging them, pleading them. They sense the severity, though, of God's indictment. He's not playing games. If I take you to court, I'm not playing games with you. If I'm like, ah, no big deal, bygones be by. If I take you to court, I have severely been offended. God is taking Israel to court. Your sin against God is no trifling matter. This is mercy. God is giving them a warning. He's giving the world a warning. As we plead with our coworkers and our children and our neighbors, or should be, this is what it looks like to be due among the nations, pleading with them. Oh, turn. There is a sin-forgiving God. He forgives his remnant who repent. So hear his indictment and turn from your sin. And if you want to induce them to that, have them remember what God has done for them in their deliverance, how he has provided for them all that they have needed for life and godliness. He's provided everything. He's not left one thing. And perhaps this morning, Christian, you find yourself a little bit bitter at God. Maybe he's taken something from you, or maybe it seems like he's not hearing. That's just your flesh. It's just my flesh. God's not been fair. But when I say that, you know what I'm doing at that moment? I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm forgetting even that this life is full of turmoil and trials and pain and suffering. But I'm starting to, to act and think like Israel of Micah 6. I've forgotten that God pulled me up out of that miry bog and he set my foot upon the rock and he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise. I've, I've forgotten that God has led me all the way, that he is the good shepherd. He doesn't forsake when the valley gets too dark. His rod and his staff, they're with us. He's constantly leading his people that he is overturning all of the evil of the world and causing it to work together for good, right? Remember Balaam, Balak, what they had intended for evil, God produced for good. Christian, even in your trials, even in your pains, you need to see God this way. He's always faithful. So remember, like Micah says here, that you might know the righteousnesses of Yahweh. To know is not just to know about. It's the same as remembering. It's not just to think about. I learned something new as I was studying a ton of Hebrew again. And um, Rod will like the name remember as Zachar. And it's, it's, it's not just to remember the past, but it's to bring the past into the present and live in light of it. So Christ died for us thousands of years ago. Remember that. Okay, check. No, in light of what he's done, bring that, that truth, that reality, that historical reality. Live in light of it today. That's what it means to remember the cross. What does it mean to know the righteous acts of the Lord? It is not just to know so you can recite them. Okay, yeah, Numbers 20 through 24 is the Bela Amundsen, Gilgal's chapter 24. Okay, I know that, Pastor. Enough. Dismiss us so I can go home and do what I really want to do. No, 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 no. That's not what it means to know. It means to have this intimate covenantal love for the way Adam knew Eve. Yeah, she's five foot four, dark hair, dark eyes. She really likes asparagus. Like, you know, okay, you can know that, but he loves his wife covenantally. Be covenantally acquainted with the righteous acts of the Lord. Study them. Let the gospel get your heart. Because if the gospel's not getting your heart, you're going to begin to act like Israel of old. You're going to think that the idols of this world are more attractive. And you'll begin to whore like the people of Israel on every mountain, every grove, everything. And God is saying, Return to me. Look at how good I've been. I'm way better than them. So God has a problem 
And he's trying to, to, to show the people of Israel who have not yet repented that they're guilty. And then he almost adds guilt upon guilt. That doesn't seem nice. Tell them that God loves them and has a wonderful plan for their life. Oh, he does, but they need to repent. This just doesn't seem something we should be doing. And yet this is what Micah is doing. Right? This, remember when Cliff preached it? Chapter 3, verse 8. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord. And I run up and down the aisles carrying flags. And I've got words of knowledge for people. And I speak in languages. And I have a prayer language. And I utter mysteries. But as for me, I'm filled with power and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his rebellion and to Israel his sin. This is part of being a spirit-filled Christian, is to say that there is a problem. A spirit-filled Christian says there is a provision that God has, but if you continue to reject it, it only enhances and multiplies your guilt. Well, the last point, verses six through eight, pleasure. You're gonna be like, where do you get that from? Just hold on. Some people think that this is perhaps, you know, some people who've been pricked to the heart. They, they, they wanna say, well, how can we get right with God? I strongly disagree with that. I think this is people who are still unbelieving. It's people who, who are saying that, God, you are a harsh taskmaster, sort of like in Jesus' parables. You remember when he gives five and three and one? And, and the last he gives one gift to, he digs a little hole and he buries it. Why? Because you're a hard master. You are cruel. You are unjust. You demand more than I can even give. And so this is the scoffer. Okay, so, so, you know, imagine, imagine you have children. Just imagine you have children and you've asked them to do something and all you've ever done is put food on the table, clothes on their back, you've prayed for them, you know, you, you watch over them, you do everything. And in a covenant relationship, you say, hey, it'd be nice if you cut the lawn. Their response is, you want me to cut the neighbor's lawn too? Maybe I'll cut all the lawns in Lethbridge. Maybe that'll be what you need. And they've missed at that moment the heart of the parent who is weeping over their selfishness, weeping over their lack of gratitude, who are rebelling in light of all that God has done for them. Right? So, so listen, God had a, a, a sacrificial system. And because they missed God's heart, they missed the purpose of the sacrificial system. It was to show them that they're guilty and that God will provide. He's always provided. He provided them in Egypt. He provided for the wilderness. He's providing for them in the promised land. And they're totally missing God. And that is the world. When you're sharing the gospel with them. Oh, you want me to go to church seven days a week? Okay, I guess that's what I'll do. That's not what God wants. He wants your heart to be broken. And so he's showing you your sin. There's one thing God will not despise, a broken and contrite heart and spirit. And that is not here. Sacrifice, please hear me, kids. Sacrifices do not please God out of an unbelieving heart. They're nothing more than filthy rags. Right? Imagine you're a wife or a husband and your spouse has been unfaithful. You want their heart. You don't want their platitudes. You love them. Return to me. Oh, you want to get another job? You want to buy me a bigger house? I don't want your house. I didn't marry you for your money. I want you. That's what God wants from you. He wants you. Children, he wants you. He doesn't just want you to show up for some. No, that's great. But some people think that way. And when you're talking, maybe with people who don't understand the gospel or Christianity, this is just how the human heart thinks. How can I pay off this God guy? Oh, my people, do you see God's heart? I've done everything for you. Why won't you just humble yourself? I don't want you to give me anything. I want you to receive what I give you. 
with what shall I come before the Lord? This isn't a broken sinner. I take this as a scoffer. Or should I bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? And they were doing that. In Micah, we'll go and read Isaiah 1. They're celebrating all the feasts. Should we invent some feasts? That's what the Pharisees began to do. We'll invent some more laws. Because that's what God wants. He, he's so exacting. He, he's, he's such a tyrant. He's like Pharaoh, I guess. Maybe we'll just try to do more to appease this angry deity. You've missed the gospel. He's done everything for your redemption. He wants Israel's heart. With calves a year old, they're worth a little bit more than calves six months old, right? And that sounds good until you get to verse 7. Will the Lord be pleased? So that's where I get my third P from. This is the pleasure part. What is God pleased with? He has a problem. How do we solve that problem? By giving God more? That's what religion says. Maybe you should go to Mass. Maybe you need to bow towards Mecca five times. Maybe you need to be better to the environment. Maybe you need to give to more charities. That's the world. That's not Christianity. That's not the gospel. All those other things are attempts to treat God like man. Read Psalm 50. You thought that I was like unto thyself. That as if I was some kind of a, I won't use that word, as if I could be bought off. Caitlin probably knows the word I was thinking about. I am not like that. You cannot buy me off. The cattle on a thousand hills, they're mine. Right? One thing we need to understand is that God needs nothing. He needs no one. He is totally sufficient and content and pleased in himself as Father and Son and Spirit. So you can't add to him. He doesn't even need your obedience. So will he be pleased with thousands of rams? I don't know how much that would cost, class, but I'm thinking millions of dollars. No. With inflation in 2024, at least. It's like one Bitcoin. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? With 10,000 rivers of oil? This is mocking hyperbole. And I think it's a huge insult to the God of covenant grace. Once Adam fell in the garden, when Adam broke what we call the covenant of works, the only way now to receive this redemption is by grace. So I'll say it as clearly as I can. Verse 8 is not going to help you outside of Christ. The social justice warriors love this. All the social justice churches, right? Micah 6, 8. That's like on their church. We're not like those gospel preaching churches. We do justice. You're still going to go to hell because you don't do it right or perfect. What pleases God? Perfection. He doesn't want your thousands of rams. He doesn't need your ten thousands of rivers of oil. He doesn't need your firstborn. Why? Because he's provided one. He's given us his son. His only son. The son in whom he is well pleased. This is the gospel. You don't give. You come to God with empty hands as a beggar and receive. This is what pleases God. Coming to him, not with life figured out, but coming to him broken. The people knew, verse 8. These are religiously schooled people. He's told you, O oh man. Now, when I was reading it, you may have noticed I said, O oh, Adam. I don't think that this is just for Israel. Some commentators said, yeah, he's using the word Adam for the covenant people. No, that's often used for humanity. So you could say, well, that was for Israel back then. This is not for us today. Verse 8 is not grace. Verse 8 is law. Most Christians treat verse 8 like grace. You think verse 7 is hard? Muslims can keep verse 7. But they cannot keep verse 8. A sheik with billions of dollars 
It can give thousands of rivers of oil, but it doesn't require a regenerate heart. So Pastor Cliff came over yesterday to try to encourage me in my sickness, serving me well. And in his third point, he talked about how God will purify his remnant, right? If you remember, I remember how you read, and I will cut off, and I will cut off. God does a lot of cutting in chapter 5. But for you to be able to carry out what he requires of you in chapter 6, there needs to be the most deepest of cuts. And it needs to be to your heart. You know what you need for Micah 6.8? You know what Israel needed? They needed to have a circumcised heart. That was what it means to cut off. Cut off. You need to cut off the flesh. The flesh can be religious. The, the flesh can try to buy God off. Share the gospel with an unbeliever. They will try their darndest to produce something so they can be saved. That's how the flesh thinks. That needs to be crucified. It needs to be cut off. So verse 8 says, I'm showing you, O oh Adam, this is what you need to say to your coworkers. God requires something of you. This is what will please him. And this should drive them to more despair. Verse 8 is like, okay, I can't do verse 7, but at least I can do verse 8. You cannot do verse 8. If you could, then Jesus died in vain, Galatians 2.21. He has told you what is the good. Covenant obedience. These are all covenant words. You need to do justice. What does it mean to do justice? Does it just mean to help out, like give some donations to BLM? No. Doing justice is to treat everyone equally and fairly in accordance with God's word. Israel was not doing that. They were, they were harming the widows. And they had unjust scales. That they treated people differently based on their economics. They treated people differently in all kinds of situations. That's not justice. Can I put it before you? That if you want God to hear you, you need to do justice? And you're like, but I haven't. Which is why you need the Lord Jesus Christ. We heard about him this morning in Sunday school. He is still serving us, as Brother Justice said, as our great high priest. See, God will hear one who does justice. What does justice look like? Not this justice, our Ghanaian brother. Justice, go and read the Gospels. This is what it looks like to do justice. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ rebuking sin, coming alongside, pointing others to Christ. Verse 8 is not ultimately what we do. Verse 8 is what Christ has done. And there is grace for the guilty, but verse 8 continues God's indictment, by the way. He's saying, you've not done justice. Just go and re-listen to Pastor Cliff's sermons. Like chapters 2 and 3 were not fun. They did not keep justice. Why? There's a progression here. They did not do justice because they did not love chesed. And they did not love chesed because they did not walk with God. You see it? So if you want to reverse engineer it, you need to first get right with God. And then he changes your desires, which then influences how you live. The world's the opposite. We're going to do, and then we'll earn God's love, and then we'll be okay. That's an anti-gospel. There's no grace in it. It still works. So you've not done justice. Always. You've not always loved kindness. Some translations say mercy. It's a tricky word. I'll just say fidelity. They've not been faithful to God or his covenant. How do you know? Look at the way they live. Go and read chapters 2 and 3 again. And why do they not love kindness? Because they do not walk with God. God is the supreme expression of, of the first two. Okay, so 
I'm getting the blank stares, probably because I'm being confused. But I want you to leave with this. God is the supreme expression of doing justice and loving faithfulness, loving chesed, loving loyalty, loving kindness, loving mercy. God does all those things. And this is the doctrine of sanctification. Okay, just track with me. You become like what you worship. And so the Jewish people, they sort of pictured life as a journey, right? Everyone loves journeys in 2024. You're on your journey. I'm on my journey. Well, even the Jews were on a journey. Blessed is the man who walks this way and doesn't walk this way. And so if you're walking with God, you're becoming more and more like him, okay? Please don't hear that you're becoming God, but you become like what you worship. Or you might say, you become like who you walk with. Proverbs 1, we say to our children, or Proverbs 12, you hang out with fools, you're gonna become like a fool. You sit among the wise, you become more wise. You begin to walk with the Lord. Don't be surprised as you are humbly walk. There's no other way to walk with him, by the way. Like how can you ever arrogantly walk with God? No, that's, a, that's an oxymoron. But as you begin to walk with him, or the Puritans would say this, if you're in a field of flowers, you begin to smell like the flowers. You have an aroma about you. I know you, you've been in the mint field today. You smell like mint. Or, no offense to John, he knows where I'm going. When he was back in Singapore, he worked on a pig farm. He'd come on over and he'd shower and everything. I know where you've been today. You've been working at the pig farm. And that's not, a, please don't take that as an insult. But you, you begin to take on those characteristics. And, and so you're like, I've got to love kindness more. I've got to do justice more. Those are not the foundation. Those are not the root. Those are the fruit. The root is walk humbly with your God. So how do you begin to walk humbly with him? Remember his righteousnesses. Go back to the source. Remember who God is and what he's done for you in Christ. It will transform how you live. It will transform how you walk in community and in this world. Now, Pastor Cliff did say that God is going to place his people in the world and they're gonna be like dew. They're going to draw the nations to them, to, to, to Yahweh. This is what it looks like. As you're walking humbly with God and you're exhibiting more of these spirit-filled attributes, characteristics, as you are beginning to embody Christ in the world, you will begin to win the world to Christ. Okay, so I don't want you to be like, well, I can't keep 6-8. You haven't. Christ has. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, these should increasingly be the things that characterize our lives as God's remnant. This is how God's going to win the world. I listened to some wonderful Dutchman yesterday. I could barely understand him, so he must have been Orthodox. And he said, I, I'm not going to do the accent, but he's like, this is the fruit of the Spirit. And it hit me. This is sort of the fruit of the Spirit in the New Testament. Right? If, you, if you were to ask the, the Old Testament Jew, sort of what is the essence of the covenant? And they would say, Micah 6, 8. To do justice to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Jesus might say this, the sum and substance of living rightly with and for God is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so Israel wasn't loving their neighbor as themselves. So what did they need to do? More sacrifices? Pure olive oil? Firstborn? No. They needed to have a right relationship with God, which then works itself out with right or righteous or just relationships with others. So I would just ask you this morning, have you found the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ? There is grace for the guilty. Micah has not been very fun for us this morning. I get it. I wish I had like a little spinner for you guys and could like sing a, a, a little ditty for you and make you laugh. But sometimes there's a place for heaviness and for weightiness, for kavod. And outside of Christ, we are guilty. But, says John, with the coming of Christ, there is grace upon grace. 
He has kept the covenant of works. He will grant the perfect righteousness that God requires, and he will get, grant it to you if you come to him humbly, lowly, just like the, the people brought down low. You want to be lifted up in God's grace? Come to him lowly with a broken and contrite heart. And only the Spirit can do that with the law, and I pray that I've preached the law in such a way as to drive you to the grace of God in Christ. And would I encourage you to do the same? I listened to way too much Spurgeon to start quoting him. But you want people to run to grace? Give them the law. Show them their guilt. And then show them the Savior who will forgive them of their sins and declare them righteous. While we remember the righteous acts of the Lord, I'm not going to preach on it, uh, Brother Charles will. But this is a remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus died for sinners. He rose for their justification. He rules and protects them and provides for them in every way. And he is returning at his parousia. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Sometimes it cuts. But Lord, we did pray this morning that the Holy Spirit would convict of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And Lord, we would confess outside of Christ we have no righteousness. We would confess that outside of Christ our sins are unforgiven. We would confess that outside of Christ there's nothing but judgment. But we lift high the cup of salvation and we say that with you there's plenteous redemption. With you is forgiveness of sins that you might be feared. And so, oh Father, this morning receive our thanks from hearts that have been cut from, from a loving and fatherly hand. Receive thanks from hearts, Lord, that are full of gratitude, that Christ became that curse, that, that Christ was judged for us, that, that Christ took our punishment. And receive our thanks for Christ's righteousness which is now accounted to us in him through faith. And as we celebrate, Lord, would, you be, would we make it more of a habit to daily remember? Help us to hear. Help us to know. Help us to love who you are as Father and Son and Spirit. But help us to love you also for what you've done. Thank you, triune God. Receive glory as we remember with thanksgiving the ultimate righteous act of the Lord, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name, amen.